In preparation, I've been thinking so much about my own journey. And I was remembering when I first started to open myself up to the possibility of religious life. After my freshman year in college, I was just coming out of a dating relationship, and I felt like the Lord had something to tell me. It seemed very clear that he was trying to get my attention, and in order to keep me from distractions, I felt like I shouldn't be looking for new opportunities to date. You have heard of a dating fast being uh, by Focus Missionaries. Well, that language seemed rather harsh to me. So I thought, what about, what about a season of singleness? You know, because seasons come and, and seasons go, you know, and it'll be like, bye-bye season of singleness, you know? <laughs> so I decided if I have to be single, I'm going to Italy. <laughs> yes, that's right, if I can't have romance, I'm going somewhere romantic. The cafes, the piazzas, the gelato the saints. So my sophomore year I signed up and I was off to Italy. We arrived at the program with my rather secular liberal university and were met with shocking news. Ladies, we owe you an apology. We overbooked the dorms. You won't be staying with the guys, uh, but 30 minutes away in a convent. <laughs> Unfortunately, the sisters have a 9 p.m. curfew. We're so sorry. I think I got to watch all the stages of grief in, in one moment. I mean, first was shock, then there was denial, and then came the rage. See, <laughs> most of the girls I was with, they were not Catholic. So someone was like, did he just say we're staying with nuns? And like, another girl was like, I haven't had a 9 p.m. curfew since I was in third grade. Total meltdowns. I mean, it was, it was incredibly ugly. And I felt a lot like Jonah. I don't know if you remember the story of Jonah, but God asked Jonah to preach to the Ninevites. And he was like, no way, I'm out of here. And he like hops a boat, tries to get away, and a huge storm comes up. And all the sailors on the boat are like, why? And Jonah's like, mm. and they're like, you. And they like throw him off, and then the fish comes. So all the girls are like, why? And I was like, mm, this is crazy. We should get our money back. <laughs> I was like, meanwhile, secretly I knew it was all for me and everyone else had to pay. <laughs> it was so I just don't want anything that violent to have to happen to you and that's why I'm glad you're here. <laughs> this afternoon we're gonna cover several topics, including first, the deepest desire of the human heart is for spousal love. Second, living spousal love in the consecrated life. And third, practicals for discerning your vocation. So first, we're made for spousal love. John Paul II said, spousal love, it is this kind of love in which a person becomes a gift for the other. We are made in the image and likeness of God, who is Trinity, a Trinity of love, a communion of persons, we long for love and for life-giving union because this is our origin and our destiny. And we were made for this spousal love to know that I am a gift and that my love is good and to make a gift of myself freely and totally to another who receives me and responds in kind. Everything about you is unique, totally unique. Not only your fingerprints and the sound of your voice, but the love of your heart, it is yours, it is distinct. Only you can love with the love of your heart. And God knows how he made you for holiness, for happiness, how you will find yourself in the gift of yourself. At last was Adam's exclamation when he saw his wife Eve, who received his delight and gratitude and wonder. Vocation requires personal preparation, and it's long before one is confirmed in either vocation. I begin to make the gift of myself now in the choices that I make, in the way I allow myself to be formed. All of this will make the gift more glorious when it is revealed where my love will be given. 
To enter into either vocation is to follow God's will for my life. And so this all takes place in conversation with him, surrendering to him, trusting him. So first, the desire for marriage. Father Timothy Gallagher, a moment of silence at the man's name, uh, is a master on prayer. And he has a book and a podcast on discerning God's will. He mentions that marriage is the natural vocation. And so at a certain point, those called to the priesthood or to the religious life will feel attracted to both simultaneously, that that's normal. So be not afraid. I remember feeling like I was going crazy. Uh, I would walk into an empty church and I'd sit down and I'd look to the right and there I was with my husband with an infant in arms and our star, like stair-step children, you know, Peter, James, John, Paul, Thomas, Philip, Bartholomew. <laughs> and I'd look to the left and there I was in a habit, kneeling, a member of every family. <laughs> I wanted both, but I knew that I could not have both. To give up, to sacrifice, to surrender the greatest natural goods, this requires a tremendous act of faith. And that's why it's so fruitful. Because it's a real offering, we want to look it in the face. No one would want to choose to discern religious life out of fear or avoidance or to escape. There should be in the heart a healthy desire for marriage, for family, for children. And if that desire is absent or is muted, ask the Lord for healing in that place of your heart. Invite him in. The same thing is true if there's fear of intimacy or commitment or that you're actually experiencing relief at the thought that you might be called to religious life, like, whew, wouldn't have to worry about all that. I would look at that with Jesus, you know? Being called to a religious vocation isn't something I can orchestrate. I can't take it on myself out of a sense of duty. Um, and I can't even like choose it for the sake of excellence. Like I want the holiest vocation. Uh, no, rather it's presented to a soul as an invitation. It's offered as a gift to which I make a free response with his grace and I accept with a wholehearted yes and respond. Now there are some sensitive souls. Being a vocation director, I've gotten to hear so many, it's a privilege to hear so many stories, but I know that there are sensitive souls who feel obligated to answer a call to religious life they haven't received. Perhaps you were told at a young age that you were going to be a sister or that you're the priest in our family, you know? I've <laughs> this, or maybe an elderly person saw you making a lengthy Thanksgiving after mass and they felt compelled to tell you your vocation. <laughs> it felt like a prophetic word and they had to share it. And then it would seem, gosh, the dreadful lot fell on me. You know, well, God, if you want my misery, fine. I'll be a religious. Obviously, it would give you pleasure to take away everything that constitutes happiness in my life. <laughs> At the same time, I kind of see why you'd pick someone like me. No one else seems to be responding to the call, and I'm the kind of person who gets pegged with this kind of stuff. It sound familiar? And let's say if you actually do feel called to marriage as your vocation, there is no need to feel guilty about not being drawn to pursue religious life. I've heard this frequently, like, I just feel so guilty uh, that I think I need to be married because I'm like telling God he's not enough. Wow, is that what the vocation proclaims? Why would God call most of his children to a vocation that proclaims he's not enough? Marriage is the image of the life-giving love of the Trinity. Marriage is the image we have of Jesus' love for his bride, the church. And perhaps that's why it's so attacked, right? It is a radical path to holiness. I had a friend who shared several years ago uh, with me that she was married and um, at a certain point the Lord brought her deeply into contemplative prayer and she was scared that she had discerned the wrong vocation. She was like, oh my gosh, I bet I had a religious vocation. So one day she was in adoration closing her eyes and she could see her husband in front of her smiling. And as he approached her, he put his hand to his face and he moved it and it was Jesus' face. And then suddenly he moved it back 
and it was her husband's face again. And she heard Jesus say, do you understand? And she understood his meaning was, when you love your husband, you are loving me. Marriage is not a default vocation. You are called to the vocation of marriage. Secondly, spousal love in the consecrated life. One of our sisters was walking across her campus late one night, and she said she felt so drawn to the chapel, it was like it came to her. Uh, she found herself kneeling in the dark with only the glow of the red tabernacle light in front of her. And she was there by herself, but she knew she wasn't alone. In that moment of silence, she said she felt her heart meet Jesus' heart, and they locked like magnets. The experience of being looked on with love, of being loved by Jesus in a way that is so total, uh, that knows me so totally, there's this recognition in the heart of the one called that I'm being loved in a way that states something. I'm being loved in a way that is asking me a question. Jesus' look of love is a beckoning look. Follow me. And in that follow me is contained a question, will you love me? Will you love me with the love that you have saved for a husband or a wife? Would you love me with all of your unique love? Will you give me your whole heart, your affections, your possessions, your will? Jesus is a person, a living person with a beating heart. He's not an idea. No, no one who's called to the consecrated life is doing it um, for the sake of like doing a special job. No one you know, gives up marriage for a special job like, like an artist, um, a writer might do that so that you can really focus your energies. No, it's about letting a real person love you with all his heart and about loving that person with all your heart. It's a total dedication. It's this mutual spousal relationship and your heart is claimed, and you know it. The woman or man called knows that he or she belongs to someone and that that someone belongs to him or to her in a particular way, a forever way, total and complete. This is the marriage that every Christian will experience in heaven. But this vocation asks us to let go of what is good, but passing, even now. And that's why the consecrated life is not a sacrament. It's not a sacrament because it never passes away. It is a call to live now the marriage feast of the Lamb that we will all live in heaven. And in living that reality on earth to be a sign of hope for souls. One of our sisters was working in the Silicon Valley for Apple. She had a great job. A uh, wonderful group of friends, but she increasingly felt restless. What is missing? Her apartment was near to a perpetual adoration chapel, and she found herself visiting there more and more frequently. And one evening after work, wrestling with her dissatisfaction, she walked into her apartment and she looked around. Everything she'd worked so hard to obtain, the furniture, the paintings, the accessories, the gadgets, she heard a little voice say, you couldn't give all this up. You'd be so ungrateful. Think of your parents, your education, all your gifts. So many people would give anything to have what you have. You have the world at your fingertips. She knew where that voice was coming from and what the suggestion was saying, and she responded definitively, I don't want the world. I want heaven. So to be with him means that he wants me with him in everything, and he knows who I am. We have a, a convent right next to a grade school in the Bronx, and although we're not teachers, sometimes the teachers invite us over uh, to like have recreation, you know, and uh, lunch with the kiddies. And I mean, who can resist the tater tots? Seriously, it's just wonderful. And the, and the you know the basketball hoops are like yay high, so like sisters are slam dunking. I mean. Jesus makes all your dreams come true. And one day, one of these little girls, a kindergartner, just kindergartners are very special, you know, they don't have a, a sense of what might be an appropriate or an inappropriate question to ask, sister. 
One of them just looks at sister and goes, so what's on your head? And it was like the whole table was like, tch, 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 tch. like everyone was like, somebody asked. <laughs> and sister starts talking about brides and weddings, and it's getting kind of rather confusing. And so she finally says, so I wear a veil because I'm married to Jesus. And as only a Bronx five-year-old can, she stands up, puts her hands on the table, and goes, he chose you. <laughs> you don't think I don't ask myself the same thing every day? <laughs> but he chooses us. It's his prerogative to make that choice. Jesus knows us. He knows our weaknesses, our vulnerabilities, our sin. He knows the ones that he chooses. It's incredible that such simple elements consecrated to Jesus uh, become his very body and blood. When you look at the bread and the wine. The consecrated religious in dedicating his or her life to God and in being consecrated is like the bread that's broken and the wine that's poured out. He or she becomes a living host in the hands of Jesus, offered in union with him to our Father by the power of the Holy Spirit uh, for the redemption of the world. And it costs, right? Every vocation passes through the cross. At final profession, it's a tradition that the religious lies prostrate on the ground during the singing of the litany of saints. And this is to symbolize the real death that is taking place. I am dying to myself and I am dying to this world. And no one takes my life from me. I lay it down freely. One of our sisters was sharing the story of how she came back for a visit to the convent after she was already an application to enter. She said the rose-colored glasses were off and it was like she could see clearly the demands and the sacrifices she would have to make in the coming future. I mean, prior she sensed there'd be an adjustment. It'd be kind of a transition. But this time she could taste the renunciations. <laughs> So she pulled a seasoned sister aside, seeing that she seemed to be a wise and experienced sort, and she shared her concern. She said, sister, I'm just noticing um, that in religious life, um, there seems to be, well, there's death. <laughs> Sensing death. And I was just hoping you could speak into the death. <laughs> Thank you. And sister got this thoughtful look, and she answered, it's a thousand deaths every day. I don't want to wake up right now. I want to sleep in. I don't want Cheerios. I want flavored yogurt and a bagel, and I want to eat it in my car. I don't want to sit by her. I don't want to put my book down and go to prayer. It's just getting good. But you know what I do? I rise and I make my morning offering. I eat the Cheerios because it's what we have. It's what God provided. I sit next to that sister because I love her and God chose us to live this life together. I put the book down and I get myself to that chapel because Jesus is calling me to be with him. What comes from these thousand deaths offered and united to Jesus is a greater joy than I can have in any other circumstances. I know on a profound level that I am not alone and that I'm free. And the one who's with me is the Lord himself, the source of all joy. There's a beauty to this. There's something uh, divine about this. There's something exponential that happens. I think of the spiritual fruitfulness of this gift. I remember when I just had made my first vows and professed them, right afterwards, I went to a focus summer training. And my sisters and I were split up, and so I was alone in a women's small group, and they kind of all like turned on me, and I felt very vulnerable. And, all, and They started asking me intensely personal questions about my experience of being Jesus' bride, and I just felt very embarrassed and unsure of my boundaries, and I kind of clammed up, and it, it was incredibly disappointing for them because I was answering with very generic responses. And as we were walking back to campus, I felt this gentle stir in my heart and the Holy Spirit. 
And I sensed Jesus asking me gently, why didn't you tell them uh, that you experienced my love as spouse? It's okay for you to share that. You can talk about that. Now, just so they know, if there's any marital discord, we all know whose fault it is. <laughs> and so I was like, oh, I'm sorry, Jesus. <laughs> and I'm kicking myself, and I'm like, wow, what a lost opportunity. And then suddenly, as we're walking back, I, I hear this huffing and this heavy footsteps running behind me. Someone's chasing us, and I'm like, oh, my glory. And I turn around, and there's, there's a, a homeless gentleman is, is rounding the bend to get in front of us. And he's like, stop, stop. And we're like, are you okay? What's happening? He's beautiful. He's like tanned by the sun. His hair is a wreck. His jumpsuit is like totally, totally filthy. And uh, he's like, just stop, wait. I always wanted to know, what's a sister? I was like, Jesus? <laughs> I couldn't believe my eyes. I was like, what's your name? He's like, Timmy. I'm like, well, Timmy, a sister is a bride of Christ. She loves him with all that she has and all that she is, and she receives everything from his heart. And a sister is a mother of souls. She loves every person as if they were her own child of flesh and blood. And with a big smile, Timmy goes, that makes me yours. I was like, you are the biggest man-child that I have. <laughs> and looking upon him, I loved him. <laughs> he was like, sister, do you know what it's like to be an orphan? He lost his parents when he was four and had, had an incredibly difficult life. I said, I can't imagine how much our Heavenly Father and Blessed Mother love you. Can we pray together? Can we pray that we'll live in such a way that we'll be together in heaven forever, the same table? And so that group of girls uh, joined me and we all held hands and we prayed. Yeah, to be called to the consecration, to be called to be a religious, is to be called to be a sign uh, for all the baptized, to see a sign of the life to come, what they too will be on the other side. It also means to be available. So even hearing our name, sister, brother, just hearing my name reminds me of my relationship to you, my relationship to Christ, that we've been entrusted to each other, that we're family. And how many are waiting for this sign to see how loved they are by God? How many are waiting for a yes to them that goes beyond natural family bonds? It's pure love, it's virginal love, it's not possessive, and yet I belong. It's pure maternity or paternity. It's birthing hearts, souls, love. So let's look at some practicals. Practicals to discerning a religious vocation. The very first thing to do is to open your heart. To open your heart and open your hands. To ask yourself the question, am I truly open? Have I surrendered my plans? What my parents would think? My fears? If you sincerely spend time with Jesus, if you sincerely open your heart to him, if you sincerely ask these questions and surrender these desires one by one, he speaks. He will speak to you. Uh, Mother Claire Mathias, CFR, she wrote a book entitled Discerning Religious Life. And she gives a great image of how impatient we are in our discernment. She says, at the end of a first date, a woman would never grab a guy by the shoulders and be like, hey, are we getting married or what? Because he'd be like, oh my gosh, I don't, I don't even know if we're going to have a second date. Uh -uh. <laughs> I don't know what, I, what to make of you. Um, it's funny to see it in that context, but most of us, and I include myself, we want the Lord to answer our questions stat, you know, like a Google God or a Siri Savior. <laughs> Doesn't work like that, does it? No, you know why? Because Jesus is alive. 
He's a real person, a living divine person with a beating heart who wants to come to know us and wants to ex- have us experience that he knows us deeply, that he's good, that he has good things for us, that he can be trusted. So I want to spend time with him. I want to come to know him. I want to give him permission to reveal his knowledge of me, that he knows my desires because he gave them to me. He knows my family. He knows my gifts and the joys that I experience. He knows where I've been. He knows what I'm struggling with. He knows my hopes and my dreams. And this takes patience and humility to surrender and to submit. And the Lord meets us where we are. And he wants to hear our hopes and our fears and our desires and our struggles because it's through these very realities that he's leading us. So be honest with him and be honest with yourself. What do I desire? What are the deepest desires of my heart? What am I most afraid of, really? So first and foremost, I would say setting time aside daily for silent prayer. 15 to 20 minutes would be ideal. If you have to start with five and build up to that, fine. But carve time out and spend it. Let it be protected. Time where the phone is off, music is off, you're in a place where you won't be interrupted. Read the mass readings, journal, just place yourself intentionally in his presence. Do it right now, close your eyes right now and place yourself under the gaze of Jesus. Imagine him looking at you. The Trinity dwells within us. You're never alone. We, we can always go into our inner room and be alone with the Father in secret. Create spaces for silence and for welcome. So even when you're not praying, be open to hearing the voice of Jesus. So limit your distractions. Go unplugged during your run or during your commute and open up a space where the Lord can speak and you can be together. Receive the graces of confession more frequently. It actually unclogs things, uh, literally. If you go to confession monthly, you can actually feel the strength that comes from that sacrament not to commit that sin again. And especially if you get a regular confessor, because then you know you have to tell the same priest. Spending time in adoration. Jesus is so humble. He's so humble to put himself before us in adoration and let us love him there and be loved by him there. If you've never read the Gospels, start, start there. Read the Gospels all the way through. What did Jesus say? What is he like? How does he respond to things? Make time for daily Mass when possible. Another sister was telling me that before she entered, she was complaining to her spiritual director about how her relationship with Jesus just seemed stagnant. She was like, it's going nowhere. I don't know what to do. And her spiritual director posed the question, well, if you were in love with someone, how often would you see him? I mean, for an hour on Saturday night? Or every day? She was like, I see him every day, obviously. He's like, well, how often are you receiving Holy Communion? Once a week. Well, see what happens when you try to receive him more often. Exponential change. Jesus truly changes us gives us himself, wholly, fully, totally. In discerning a religious vocation, it's, it's very helpful not to be in a dating relationship. It's very hard to discern when, when um, yeah, you're attached to someone and that decision would, would impact that person. So that's the first discernment. Should I be dating right now? Should I be in this relationship? Uh, being in good health, uh, having vibrantly practiced your faith, uh, and for those who are converts to the Catholic faith, even for years, just to be stable, stable and solid in that. Uh, living free from struggles with uh, drug use, alcohol use, abuse, and um, sexual struggles for a period of time. And that time would uh, differ according to the community. The reason for this, it's beautiful, there's a wisdom to that, that maybe if I was healed, or I received a lavish mercy from Jesus, I might just feel like I owe God 
Like, wow, you were so good to me, I'm going to pay you back. I'm entering the convent, you know? And he's like, whoa, 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 I just <laughs> I wanted you to come back to me, you know, but I have another plan for you. So giving yourself permission to have that time where you uh, kind of reestablish the intimacy of that relationship. Because what you're doing is you're listening for an invitation. You're listening for a movement and a draw within your heart. Because a call to religious life isn't just a good idea. Uh, it's not just a viable option. It's not something that just adds up. If you look at the stats of my life, you're like, oh, there it is. Gosh, it's right there in front of me. It just all adds up. If you sense him inviting you to consider the possibility of religious life, um, the next step would be to ask, like, what is this life like? A lot of us didn't grow up near religious or didn't see it lived. So it was very, I mean, you got the sound of music and sister act. <laughs> that, very confusing, the sound of music, because she gets married at the end and has a huge family. Yeah. And then sister act, we all know that religious life isn't like that, right? I hope, yeah. Although we are going to sing to you at the end here. No. <laughs> uh, but finding a trusted spiritual director or a confessor can really help you uh, discern the Lord's movements in your heart. It's good to know that you're not alone in your discernment. There are three parts to a religious vocation. The first part is that it's a divine initiative. It's not something I initiate with God, it's something he initiates with me. The second is that there's a graced response. Because it's supernatural, I need grace to respond, and the Lord provides it. And the third is that the church confirms. So someone in authority who's vested with grace in the church to guide souls to discern their vocation says, indeed, I do perceive God is inviting you to this, to take a step forward. Sometimes we think we know the fulfillment of our desires and we think we know what God is calling us to, but because we can't see everything or know everything, we need another to, to confirm for us. I think about our Holy Father, John Paul II, who was the only seminarian who repeatedly in asking to enter the Carmelites was told no. All the other seminarians who asked got to leave and enter the Carmelites, but not John Paul II, not Carol Waitiba. And do we see why? God wanted us to have a Carmelite pope. And then I think, too, of the Martens, Louis Martin and Zélie Martin, St. Therese's parents. Her father, Louis Martin, tried to enter a monastery. He couldn't get the Latin down, and they were like, you're not going to make it, man. <laughs> and he left the monastery, didn't, knew he didn't have a religious vocation. Zaylee Martin tried to enter the Visitation Cloistered Convent because her sister was already there too. She was very contemplative, very prayerful woman. And the superior was like, I'm sorry, I don't perceive God opening this door. They were both disappointed. And then they met. Their eyes locked. Without the two of them saying yes to their vocation to marriage, we wouldn't have St. Therese of Lisieux, who is a doctor of the church. Can you imagine if any of them insisted on having their own way? Then we need to step out of the boat sometimes and take that risk after we've come to a place where we're realizing the Lord is continually prompting, continually confirming that he is asking me to take steps forward and we have to step out of the boat. Um, another sister who was studying as a scientist, she started discerning her vocation and she told her spiritual director, like, I have a religious vocation. She even had an Excel spreadsheet for her discernment with the communities, her preferences, uh, it was completely organized. Her spiritual director took one look at that and said, that's nice. They didn't talk about it again for two years as she dove into prayer. And spending time with him, she became familiar with his voice, how he spoke to her, how he loved her, how he was drawing her, healing her, giving her gifts, revealing the gifts she didn't even realize she had. And it was only then she sensed the Lord calling her out of the boat like Peter and she left her PhD program. It can be good to reach out and find a, a way to spend time with brothers or to spend time with sisters, uh, to see firsthand the joy of a life dedicated to Jesus, imitating him in poverty, chastity, and obedience. It can cast out some of the fears and misconceptions and stereotypes, which can lessen the anxiety that you might have and help you to feel freer, truly open. So some examples might include uh, yeah, joining them for prayer at their convents or friaries, going on a weekend retreat where you know they'll be present, serving on a mission trip alongside them, watching them live. 
as the attraction begins to grow, there may be a specific community that you feel drawn to. So there might be a charism or an apostolate or a way of praying that your heart just is enlivened by, your heart responds to. When you see it, something, yeah, is lit. It corresponds to a passion. Take courage and reach out to that community to speak to the vocation director, uh, to share your journey, to ask for guidance. You can only discern in your head for so long. I know a lot of people who discern in the ideal or in the imagination in their head, and it's just at a certain point you're just spinning. You need help. And then as you go deeper in prayer, know that things might come up. Uh, elements from your past might resurface, and fear not, fear not. Now is the time to be able to look at them with Jesus. So find a wise spiritual director, a trusted mentor, a counselor, someone to help you sort through some of the blocks, to help you untie some of the knots. This opens your heart, it dispels lies, and it frees you to receive God's plan for you. I remember for myself, when I was discerning, I got to a point where I was incredibly frustrated. I felt incredibly impatient. I didn't know what God was saying or doing, or yeah, if I, if I could say yes, if he was asking it. I remember one of my friends was discerning the priesthood and we were all over at a house and he was like, oh my gosh, God totally confirmed my call to the priesthood. And he started sharing about this prayer experience he had and like how the scriptures came alive. And he was like, you know, he like had jumped into a Mary Poppins, you know, chalk picture and he was like in it. And I was like, oh my gosh, it was like IMAX theater style. Like what he heard and saw and what Jesus had done. And I was like, that's great. I'm so happy for you. <laughs> that night I went to the Adoration Chapel in my little town. <laughs> I like, I poured Jesus, I like opened the door, I was like, but bam! And I'm like, there he was, all, all vulnerable on the altar. He's like, no! No, just kidding. I was like, oh, hi there. Hey. Yeah, I heard you're giving out answers to other people. Yeah. Who've been praying a lot, <laughs> shorter time than me. And I remember having a really good, solid cry at the kneeler there in front of Jesus, just so that he could see how hurt I was. You know, an elderly woman, like, sneakily, like, slipping me a tissue under my elbow kind of a thing. You know, I'm like, don't worry. No, I want to let them flow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I looked at him, and I remember sensing in my heart, am I not equally generous with you? Yeah. It was a beautiful moment of recognizing, like, I am deeply, deeply known, and I am loved as I am, and I don't know what's best, and I can trust him. I can trust that he knows when I can receive the gift of my vocation and stop grasping at it. So I thought maybe we'd end. Each of you has a litany of trust. Uh, one of my sisters wrote that prayer. Um, trust is really what's critical. I want you to keep that. Uh, for yourself and pray that next prayer period maybe start your prayer period with that uh, but I thought we would end with a song um, that one of our sisters wrote and it's the image is Jesus calling the fishermen on the seashore and on this solemnity of Mary mother of God who said yes who said yes and followed we think about what it means to say yes to Jesus the courage that it takes and the goodness and the love in his eyes that when he calls us, he's never, ever outdone in generosity. Sending upon the shore, searching for me.
deepest love.